say about persuasion in one of his, uh, his more famous speeches. Um, I'll then turn to the Greek philosopher Plato, uh, the uh, British philosopher Thomas Hobbes, and then Alexander Hamilton, um, a bit on the dangers of rhetoric. I'll then turn to the Greek philosopher Aristotle and the Roman uh, philosopher statesman Cicero on its possibilities. I'll briefly turn to James Madison and how he tried to think through rhetoric and how, how to deal with it. Um, and then I'm gonna really turn much more towards contemporary politics and rhetoric. I'm gonna talk about elite polarization, um, partisan identities, a little bit about social media, and then I'll just say a few things sort of looking forward by way of conclusion. Um, so let's turn first then to Abraham Lincoln. Now on the screen in front of you, um, you can see a, a fairly long passage from uh, his famous temperance address, which he gave in 1842. Now I've selected this passage because what you can see in this is Lincoln talking about the importance of persuasion and how politically effective he thinks persuasion actually is. Um, in particular, he thinks that you can't change someone's mind. You can't appeal to their reason without engaging them emotionally and in particular without demonstrating somehow that you are what he calls a sincere friend. So he says a drop of honey catches his heart. Now that's one way of talking about rhetoric and thinking about rhetoric and Lincoln of course is a master orator. Um, and this shows the way in which Lincoln understood persuasion to be central to the task of politics. Now I begin with Lincoln because that's very much possibility, that's very much potential. Um, so then why do I suggest dangers in the title of the talk? Now to start to answer this, I wanna step back first to democratic Athens um, and specifically to the Greek philosopher Plato to whom I'll turn in just a moment. Uh, classical Athens, as, as most of you are, I'm sure will know, um, it's the birthplace of democracy. And what this means, practically speaking, is that in classical Athens, 5th century BCE, 4th century BCE, um, in classical Athens, power is exercised through and it's mediated by speech. Um, what this means is that decisions are made, whether in the courts or in the assembly, after people speak and hear arguments. And that's how this actually worked. Um, now, why is speech so central to Athenian politics? Well, if we think about the term democracy, it, it's a Greek word, it comes from uh, classical Greek. Uh, what it means is quite literally rule of the people or power of the people. Demos means people, kratia means something like power or rule. So in Athens, the form of government is literally the rule of the people. What that means is that the people make the decisions, whether in smaller or larger groups. What that also means is that if you're an Athenian citizen, you can, at least in principle, get up and speak in front of the assembly. Now, we can actually see this in the historical record. For example, uh, Athenian assemblies began with a ritualistic question, which is, who wishes to advise the assembly? Now, that's a little bit on, on Athens in the context. So Plato, um, the greatest of the Greek philosophers, is also the first to systematically think about rhetoric. And he argues in a dialogue called the Gorgias um, that a regime that centers on persuasive speech is dangerous, it poses a problem, it's a dangerous problem. So he basically says, look, either speaking persuasively requires that you have particular knowledge. So uh, a physician speaks persuasively about medicine because they have knowledge about medicine, or Plato says, rhetoric and persuasive speech is an art that doesn't require any specific knowledge. It's just a sort of ability to speak persuasively. Now, Plato says, well, that's what it actually is. It's not a specific knowledge, it's just some knack, he says, for persuasive speech. Now, if that's the case, he says, then that means that they don't actually know anything, right? They may know something, but it's not part of being a rhetorician. What they actually do as a rhetorician, Plato says, is they trick people. They, they engage in flattery, and that's illustrated in this passage that I have 
on the screen in front of you. Cookery, he says, it imitates medicine. It gets us to eat things not because they're good for us, but because they taste good to us, right? Now, the danger that this poses is that a rhetorician is, generally speaking, a flatterer, says Plato. And they get people to do things by means of manipulation through pleasure. What this means in particular for Plato is that democracy is a regime in which the blind lead the blind. The orators or speakers lack knowledge and the audience lacks knowledge. Okay, so that's one moment and this is the sort of classical Greek moment I want to begin with to think about why or how might rhetoric be thought to be dangerous. And the second one is Thomas Hobbes. Here we're moving forward in time into the 17th century. Um, Hobbes articulates one of the core modern worries about rhetoric. Hobbes worries about rhetoric because he thinks it is destabilizing. It's politically and socially destabilizing. He thinks it is predicated upon disagreement and it reinforces disagreement. So if you think about it, and this is Hobbes' argument, if I'm making an argument on one side in a judicial case and you're making it on the other, I'm gonna take the same phenomenon that you're describing and I'm going to describe it in opposite terms, right? That's how rhetoric works, he thinks. But we don't only do this when we're arguing, we do this, he thinks, whenever we use evaluative language or moral language. When I describe something as courageous, and here's what this, this quotation is getting at. When I describe something as courageous, I am saying something not only about the thing itself, but about myself, right? It's reflected of my own experience. And I may not tell you what my experience is. I may not be aware of what my experience is, okay? Now, what this means, Hobbes thinks, is that rhetoric is fundamentally dishonest in certain ways. And in particular, he thinks that popular rhetoric, the rhetoric you'll engage in when speaking to a crowd, fosters disagreement and it does so in a way that is quite literally violent for him a lot of the time. Now, it's no accident that Hobbes thinks this about rhetoric, biographically speaking. Um, Hobbes lived through the tumults of the English Civil War, it culminates in the beheading of Charles I. Um, and Hobbes thinks that the Civil War basically happens in no small part because of popular rhetoric. Now, um, those are just two snapshots of the dangers or potential dangers of rhetoric that I've drawn from history. Um, and I would be remiss if I didn't say, share one that's from a little bit closer to our time and obviously from America. Here we have Alexander Hamilton played by Miranda in the wonderful musical. Um, and this is Hamilton on why he's so worried about rhetoric. What he says here in the passage is demagoguery right? The danger to republics, to self-governing free political communities, he says, are demagogues who pay what he calls an obsequious court to the people, and they end up as tyrants. Now, they don't do this unless they're smooth talkers, okay? So that's Hamilton. Okay, now I've chosen those three writers, those three moments, because they illustrate something that's fundamentally worrisome about political rhetoric, and it continues to worry people today. You can hear people articulating claims like this in all sorts of media, in all sorts of uh, venues. Manipulation, destabilization, demagoguery. Okay, those are three core worries about rhetoric. So what about the possibilities? Now here I wanna go back again to antiquity. Uh, this is an image of the philosopher Aristotle. Um, and he is Plato's greatest student in a way, and he's also Plato's greatest critic. Critic, excuse me. Now if you ask Aristotle, well, what's rhetoric? I provided you with the answer. It's the power, he says, of observing the means of persuasion on any subject presented to us, okay? Um, and it's not concerned with anything definite. It's just the ability to observe the means of persuasion. Now, how does Aristotle actually think this works? 
Well, it works by what he calls proofs or what I'm calling or prefer to call the means of persuasion. And you'll know these if you've taken a course or have a background in public speaking or composition. And one of them is the character of the speaker. The Greek here is ethos, right? Um, one of these is the audience's emotions or pathos. We get from that term our, our term pathetic, right? Um, and then, of course, there's the argument itself, right? Or the facts of the matter. He calls this logos. Now, what Aristotle thinks is that, well, look, if you're a speaker and you're speaking persuasively, what you do is you give attention to your character and how your audience will perceive it, right? Um, you give attention to the emotions of the audience, right? What do I want to produce in you? Are there emotions that I want to tamp down or magnify as I speak? Um, and then finally, there's the actual argument itself. Now, this is what rhetoric is. And rhetoric, he thinks, is something that accompanies knowledge, but it's not simply flattery, right? There's more to it than what we saw in Plato. That's not the only thing we can say about rhetoric from antiquity. And here I'm turning to Cicero, Roman philosopher, statement, statesman. Cicero says, well, another thing that really matters in terms of thinking about speech is the actual style of the speech and the style of the speaker. Um, he says that there's really three ideal types, basically, of speaking. One of these he calls the plain form. And this is the sort of speech you would use between friends, between equals. Not a lot of figures of speech, not a lot of adornment, very plain. And then there's what he calls the grand form. This is adorned by figures of speech. Speech, this is very powerful. Think of fiery oratory, right? And in fact, he uses in Latin a term related to the word in English for fire. And then there's the middle, somewhere between the two. Now, what he's interesting in doing and talking about style as he does is he says the way in which you speak is going to, in terms of your style, the way in which you speak is going to depend on the task at hand. And you may use different kinds of speech in the course of a single oration, depending on your purposes, or he says quite crucially, depending on the faces of your audience. So just to give an example of this, when I lecture, um, and usually I do this in a classroom where I can actually see people in front of me, this has all been uh, disconcerting to say the least in terms of uh, gauging results responses. So that's, uh, this has been the case for everybody. But what I do is I watch my students and I can tell when I need to, you know, liven things up because they start doing this, right? They're falling asleep. So I'll change my style. I mean, that's what Cicero is talking about, that we'll adjust the way we speak depending on the task and depending on our literal read of the audience in front of us. Now, Given what I've just said about Aristotle and Cicero, what I want to suggest is that what makes persuasion possible in classical rhetorical theory are certain assumptions about speaking and listening, about speaker and audience. First, um, Aristotle and Cicero, but certainly Aristotle, thinks that the reason why we can speak persuasively is that we can have some rough understanding of our audience. So I've reproduced in front of you here a passage from his rhetoric, and he, he talks about three different kinds of audiences. These are all a function of age. Um, and I have reproduced part of what he says about young people. Um, and this is basically, he says, well, look, if you're talking to young people, this is how they are. This is how you talk to them, right? Now, what this is getting at, though, is that any given audience um, can be known to be of a certain sort, to share certain ways of seeing, and to be subject to fairly predictable patterns of response. Fairly predictable. It's not certain, but it's fairly predictable. Um, so that's one point from classical rhetoric. The second is that with both Aristotle and Cicero, being persuasive requires you as a speaker to shape your character to meet the audience. Um, now, Plato would say, well, this is just manipulation. It's flattery, 
Um, well, I would suggest that for Aristotle and Cicero, and certainly for Lincoln, with whom we began, it's not manipulation. What it is, is a way of mutually engaging with your audience and opening yourself up to your audience, speaking to them on their terms. Third and finally, both Aristotle and Cicero recognized that the audience limits the orator, right? What you say and how you say it as a speaker is constrained by the people you're speaking to. You have very limited power, even though they both think that oratory is quite powerful. So step forward now to the 18th century. Uh, what do the first Americans think of rhetoric? And I already shared that quote from Alexander Hamilton and his worries. Well, now I'm gonna turn just to, for a moment to James Madison, um, namesake of, of uh, Madison, Wisconsin. Now, Madison said famously in one of his Federalist papers, this is Federalist 55, um, he wrote these along with John Jay and Alexander Hamilton. He says, had every Athenian citizen been a Socrates, every Athenian assembly would still have been a mob, right? So this illustrates that Madison, like Hamilton, who we just saw, was worried about direct popular participation in politics, and he was worried about having large assemblies make decisions. What it does not illustrate, though, is that he wants to get rid of disagreement. In fact, and this passage I've got in front of you here, um, disagreement is due to political liberty for Madison. If you have liberty, right, liberty is to faction what air is to fire. If you have liberty, you will have political conflict. And getting rid of it, the cure, is worse than the disease. Because the only way to get rid of it, he says, is to get rid of liberty. What do you do? Well, he designs this wonderful constitutional system. We have senates, senators who um, represent very large uh, geographic areas. We have House members who represent small ones, and they sort of complement each other. We have separation of powers. We have a written constitution. We have elections, but very little in the way of democratic participation, at least in the original constitution. That's how you have liberty but you minimize the dangers of, of rhetoric and demagoguery in particular. So that's a little bit on Madison. And at this point, what I've done is given you a sort of snapshot of the ancient and modern case against rhetoric. Um, and just a bit on how Madison sought to deal with it. And what I wanna do now is connect this historical discussion to much more contemporary um, uh, political science and, and, and communication studies and some of the things that we all hear about. So first, some facts. Um, all of us have heard something I suspect about political polarization. It at least used to be the case, I don't know if it still is, that we have the two most polarized senators in, in the Congress, uh, Senator Baldwin and Senator Johnson. Um, it may be the case that someone else has replaced them. Um, but what does polarization actually mean? Well, it means that, in a sense, the parties are far apart and individual politicians within them are far from each other. It's polarized, right? Now, this image on the screen in front of you, it lets you actually see this. Each of the dots, I mean, it's, it's hard to see them individually. Each of the dots is a member of a particular Congress, right? Um, and uh, this is beginning in the year 1949. And what these images show is how close the parties are to each other, how close each member of each party is to the members of the other one, and then how close they are to each other. And what you can see is that the parties move apart and they become clumpier as time goes on. Okay? That's one way of seeing, in a sense, polarization. Okay? Now, why do people tend to worry about polarization? Not everybody does. Some people think it's actually very good. And we can talk about that if, if people are interested. Um, but what people will suggest about why it may not be so good are things like this. It creates gridlock, right? It makes legislation more difficult. It degrades national discussions. It can foster inequality. It can foster segregation. 
It can undermine trust and empathy, um, and it weakens citizenship. So those are all very real worries that people have. Now that's elite level polarization. It's not the only way to talk about or think about polarization. Another phenomenon is what people will call uh, uh, affective polarization. And this is a much more mass level phenomenon. So there's a political scientist at the University of Maryland named Lillian Mason, and she conducted a survey in which she found that the more strongly somebody identifies as a liberal or a conservative, the more likely they are to favor socializing only with those who are like them. So strong liberal wants to socialize with strong liberal, strong conservative with strong conservative. That's not too surprising, perhaps. Um, but she went further. She tried to figure out whether that was a function of policy views, right? The reason why a strong liberal wants to hang out with strong liberals is because they agree on policies, or is it a function of identity, political identity? And she found that it was, in fact, a function of identity. And she did this by sort of tweaking the questions that people asked, or that she asked people, rather. Um, so one example of this is she would find, for example, that somebody who identifies as a moderate liberal and is pro-choice is less opposed to marrying a conservative than somebody who identifies as a strong liberal and is actually not pro-choice, okay? So what matters is the strength of the identification, not the policy position. So the stronger your partisan identification is, the more powerfully it predicts your attitude to the other side, regardless of your actual policy views. Now, what this means is that the more partisan we are, the less tolerant we are of those who we perceive of as having the opposite partisanship, the less likely we are to want to encounter them. And again, this is identity, she argues. Now, why is this a problem? And these are points that she'll raise and others will raise. First, it can make it hard to choose policies, right? If the idea is that policy or that, that you know, political parties should predict policy orientation, right? So if somebody's a Republican, they should have this set of policy views. If someone's a Democrat, they should have this set. Um, that makes sense, right? But if it's not the case that what people are actually interested in are policy views, but just the identity, that makes it harder to pick people. It makes it harder to sort through things when it comes to the act of voting. The other reason why this may uh, be difficult or could lead to problems is that it could lead to us choosing policies, not because of the policy, but because of who supports them. And this is something that I think all of us can think of examples of. What matters is not the policy, but whether your team is for it or your team is against it, okay? Now, that latter point is, is she'll suggest, maybe why Americans can seem to switch their views on policies very, very quickly, okay? depending on who happens to be in power. What else do we see at the micro level? Well, this is social media, the blessings thereof. Um, this is a study that I've uh, was written up in the New York Times back in 2018, which illustrates that Facebook tends to do strange things. Now, it's not only the case that it undermines the ways in which communities inculcate norms. It, it can do this, right? Because Facebook is a community that's not necessarily linked to a particular place, right? It crosses boundaries, okay? And the cues you might pick up from your peers in your neighborhood or peers um, at your school could be muted by people who may be further away or not part of your local community at all. But the point that this, uh, this piece that's written up in the Times uh, suggested is that it also tends to take us not towards moderation, but towards extremism. It tends to create like-minded groups and it tends to supply us with content that reinforces this. So the researchers whose piece was described in this New York Times article, they're at the University of Warwick in England. Um, they studied every single anti-refugee attack in Germany over a two-year period, 3,335 attacks in a two-year period. 
And all things being equal, they found that if it's a town or a city with Facebook use higher than average, there were more attacks on refugees. It didn't matter if it was a big city or a village. It didn't matter if it was rich or poor. It didn't matter if it was liberal or far right. It was usage of Facebook and how much it's used. Okay? And they argued, uh, controversially, but they argued that 10% of anti-refugee violence could be directly a function of increased Facebook usage. Okay? Why? Because social media can scramble the moral judgments that we make, judgments which prior to social media would have been rooted in a local community. Now, lest you say I'm focusing on Facebook, I'll just say something about Twitter here. I suppose Twitter's been in the news quite a lot lately. Um, liberals tend not to retweet what conservatives say, and conservatives tend not to retweet what liberals say. Okay? Now, the authors of the study that this image in front of you comes from, um, the study's called Emotion Shapes the Diffusion of Moralized Content in Social Networks, published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. They found that the more moral and emotional a tweet is in terms of its content, the more likely it is to be retweeted. That seems pretty obvious, right? People respond to anger and the like on Twitter. What they also found, though, was that this tended to happen within like-minded networks. Liberals and conservatives retweet different things. And this is a, a, a graphic representation of retweets. You can see that there's very few blue spots on the red side and very few red spots on the blue side. Now, why might all of these things be a problem from the perspective of classical rhetoric and even into the 18th century? Insofar as classical rhetoric relies upon being able to assume that an audience shares a set of values values, references, ways of judging, and the willingness of the speaker to open themselves up to rejection. Um, that may not work anymore, okay? We can't assume that speakers will be able to persuade in anything like the way that Aristotle or Cicero, let's say, thought that they could. Insofar as politicians are rational, we can expect them to speak not to reach out to those who see the world differently from them, to persuade them, but perhaps to preach to the choir, to try to mobilize people. Now, a lot's been written about micro-targeting, data mining and advertisements, things like that. Um, to the extent that you're interested in mobilizing rather than persuading, you're probably doing something different from what we see Abraham Lincoln talking about. Doesn't mean it's bad, it just means it's not the same as what he calls persuasion, I would suggest. Now, some conclusions are what I've just called looking forward. Um, one thing to note, and this goes back to the piece from Facebook I alluded to, also the piece about Twitter. Ideological monotony, meaning you're only exposed to like-minded people, it seems to produce very real harms, okay? But ideological diversity produces real goods, okay? This is this piece by, or book rather, by Diana Mutz called Hearing the Other Side. And what she suggests in her study is that the more you encounter people with different views from you, it tends first to moderate your own views, and second, it makes you aware of why other people think as they do. It fosters toleration. Doesn't mean that you agree with people, but it does lead to less intense partisanship and greater empathy. Now, that's not an easy thing to do, okay? Uh, we don't generally like our views to be challenged, and we're all, and I would suggest, or not all, but at least many of us, not particularly good at challenging the views of others in a way that doesn't trigger, you know, the fight or flight response. But there is a way of doing this. And I've just provided the title of the book on the screen there. This is a book by Danielle Allen, a really wonderful book, and she's a very uh, fantastic scholar, um, called Talking to Strangers. And what she does in that book is think through how can you talk to people who don't just disagree with you, but people who are on the opposite side of divides of race, okay? 
Second, going back to social media. Um, in a 2004, Miss Manners wrote a response to a reader who, who would uh, send her a note saying, oh, I'm so sad that, you know, dinner table conversation has declined from its heyday. Um, and uh, this person in particular said, we should be talking about politics and religion at the table. And Miss Manners wrote the following, you mean people of mixed political opinions who are gonna feel free to say what they think about the morals and intelligence of people, <coughs> excuse me, the morals and the intelligence of people who disagree with them about politics or sex or religion, which are also banned from the dinner table. Now there's a reason why we're not supposed to talk about those things at dinner, right? Why we're often taught this. It's because it's hard to assume that people at the table will express their views and encounter those that differ from them in a polite way. How do you then have a pleasant evening? Well, the old wisdom is you just don't talk about those things unless you really know the person perhaps, right? Now, think of how strange it is to be to broadcast in harsh terms often one's political views to five or six or seven or 800 friends on Facebook or 50 million followers on Twitter. This would not have been done by and large outside of very special circumstances prior to the advent of social media. And I think it's a strange development. And I don't think that we've necessarily thought through all of what this has done for how we speak and how we listen. Um, but it certainly would have been very strange to do in the past, to, to speak in this way. Now, I myself, I've tried, I'm not always successful about this, but I've tried to um, stop posting as much as I used to about politics on Facebook, um, primarily because I realized that the small number of actual real life friends that I have who disagree with me politically, small number on Facebook that, that, that are there, um, the small number of them, that relationship is more important to me than the value I get in having people like my posts. And so I tried to stop doing it. Now it's hard not to because that, that rush of approval is, is a very powerful thing, but that was the choice that I've tried to make. Um, Finally, and this is the one thing that actually really does come down to something of proposal on my part, I think it would be a very good thing if we started to teach rhetoric and especially classical rhetoric again and to teach it to young people and to incorporate it into more disciplines. Why? Uh, at a minimum, it's going to make you a more savvy consumer of rhetoric, more aware of when and how you're being manipulated when you're being manipulated. I think that's, that's probably the case. But more importantly, I'm hopeful that uh, if we learn how to think about arguing, right, on persuasively, on and potentially on topics you don't agree with, um, we can start to inhabit different ways of seeing the world. And we'll realize the importance not only of meeting people on their terms, but of embracing our fallibility and embracing our vulnerability. Will we come to agree with each other? Probably not. Um, will we think as a Democrat that someone who a few years ago is a supporter of Scott Walker must be a terrible human being, right? Or as happened when I used to teach at the University of Georgia, someone who supported President Obama was clearly a terrible person. This was the sort of thing that I might hear at times. Um, there I'm optimistic the answer might be no, right? That it might get people to see that there are different ways of seeing the world and that may not be the worst thing. If we can learn to disagree with that, each other without hating each other, perhaps we could speak to each other with an eye towards persuasion and not just victory at all costs. Okay? But I'm going to stop there and uh, thank you all for your attention. Um, and uh, as Liz uh, mentioned, I'm happy if there are any uh, questions to take any questions or, or any comments. Do feel free to um, unmute yourself or you could use the chat box if you prefer. It looks like we've got a question um, about how does rhetoric relate to debate as done in high school or college forensics? Right, uh, so um, 
I think the answer is in a sense it's complicated. There's something, uh, th those who've done this may be able to speak to this actually better than I am, but there's something that's called spread, which is a sort of, it's, it's a neologism made up of the co combination of two words, speed read or speed reading. And um, there's a great uh, uh, documentary called Resolve, which is about high school debaters, and you can see spread. Spread is basically speaking as fast as humanly possible because the human ear, you can, you can understand very fast speech. And the idea is basically you just get out as many arguments as you can, bang, 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 right? Um, and it's sort of overwhelming the people you're arguing against with sheer volume of, of claims. And the, the judges are going to basically kind of tally up this and that, and then you, you get your, your answer. What's interesting about that particular documentary is there's a team, um, they're all African American, if I remember they're from uh, uh, LA, I may be mistaken about that, but I believe they're from LA. And they basically say, we're not going to play by those rules. What we're going to do is we're actually going to engage in rhetoric, okay? Meaning we're going to speak with an eye towards persuading about actual issues. We're going to speak slowly and we're going to emotionally engage each other. Now, those are, you know, two very stylized examples. I think in practice, um, debate incorporates a lot more of kind of classical rhetoric than it does in the spread model. And I've spoken to college students who were high school debaters. Um, I advise a debate society um, and that, you know, they've done this more recently and they, they tell me that the spread is, is going out of fashion. I don't know how true that is. Again, I don't you know, follow high school debate per se. Um, but there's an overlap. And now I also think that where you can really see this um, less in the sort of high school competitive, let's say, but more in the debate that we're familiar with, um, political debate, you can certainly see rhetoric as in the classical sense of what persona am I trying to convey to you? Um, what emotions am I trying to activate or minimize in my audience? You can see that very clearly, um, I think, in, in sort of formal political debate. But that, that's the way that I would um, suggest this. My general sense is that um, what matters much more at the level of um, forensics, let's say, or, or high school debate is the factual argumentative side um, and less the sort of extemporaneous, emotional, uh, characterological dimension of things. That, that's, that's the sense that I have. Um, but thank you for the, the question. I see, should I read it, Liz, or do you want to uh, read the? Oh, well, oh go I'll, ahead. I'll, yep, go uh, ahead. Okay, so this is from Linda, um, and I apologize if I'm mispronouncing your last name, Bru Bruges or I, I, I suspect I mispronounced so, in which case I apologize. My, my last name is also, uh, <laughs> can throw people for a loop. Um, the diagram showing the polarization of Democrats and Republicans seemed to start before social media was introduced. What are some other facts that cause increased polarization? So th this is the one about Congress in particular. So um, you can see at the beginning, this I can pull up that image again. Um, uh, we go. So the further back towards really right after World War II, the less pronounced polarization is. Um, and where it really starts to pick up, I'm going to move my chat function. You can see this here is 67. Um, that is 65, I believe. Uh, oh, no, no, that's 87. I'm, I'm not able to read the numbers. So where do you start to see the pull apart? This is, this is really uh, the defection of, of um, or party switches, frankly, of Southern Democrats, right, to the Republican Party. Um, and people who, who, you know, study this will say, well, look, I mean, if you look at these middle areas, these are your conservative Democrats on the one hand and your sort of classical New England Republicans on the other hand. So it picks up in the 70s and then it accelerates once you get into the 80s, right? Now, um, the point about Facebook, and it's a good point that you raised, so polarization at the elite level long precedes social media, right? 
um, when do social media really come onto the scene? It's back when MySpace was a thing that <laughs> there was a funny Onion article about MySpace that it was a civilization with 200 million inhabitants that vanished from the face of the earth. Um, so elites have been polarizing for longer. The point about mass level polarization, but in particular affective partisanship, the sense that I have from reading that is that's a much more recent phenomenon. Um, but it's a, it's a good question to ask. So what are some other factors that can uh, increase polarization? So number one, um, the flight of Southern Democrats into the Republican Party and uh, the gradual whittling away of old kind of New England Northeastern Republicans. Um, another phenomenon that probably has something to do with it, depending on which scholar you talk to, is um, uh, uh, gerrymandering, right? So if you imagine a district in which you have a sort of perfect bell curve for the population, right, where half the, the population is in the middle, right? And then the tail ends of the curve, your further right voters, further left are much smaller numbers. Well, if it's the case that you can gerrymander your district so that as, as we heard stories about in Wisconsin, for example, um, you have politicians going to literally the level of this condo building, right? I want in my district. Um, what that's going to do is it's going to lead to skewed electorates. Okay, now if your electorate is skewed, then it makes sense that um, even if they're not in the national sense particularly ideological, but they are generally speaking skewing right, that's going to trickle up. That's another explanation people will point to. Um, people point to the weakening of the political parties. It used to be the case that the parties had a lot more control over who ran for office. That's less the case now. Other people will point to primaries, right? I mean, in a primary, who's more likely to vote? More ideological voters, right? Because it takes time and effort to vote, it takes time and effort to be informed, and it's costly. Um, and, and so that's another thing. So th those are all factors that people will, will point to in terms of polarization. Um, on the graphic of polariz, this is from Cindy, on the graphic of polarization, elites or politicians, how is the blue-red divide determined? Um, and that's this same one. Um, so this particular graphic, I believe, I don't think I wrote the source, but I believe this comes from the work of Keith Poole. Um, who's a scholar of Congress at the University of Georgia, um, who is quite prominent in studying polarization. And what he really does is he looks at voting, okay? I mean, ha that's the thing about Congress. It's like baseball or basketball, lots of statistics. They look at voting and roll call votes in particular, they're all public, um, and they sort of plot where do the votes fall on an ideological spectrum, right? Now, what that translates into is a uh, lack of consensus, different voting patterns, right, on specific policies. Some things are, are even today, sometimes at least, fairly uncontroversial. Do we name this post office after this person, right? Um, those are not particularly controversial. Some votes are extraordinarily controversial and are going to be very, very polarized. Um, but that's that's what's going on in that particular graphic. And so what you're seeing is the parties pulling apart from each other and then getting clumpier, right? That means that individual members of the parties are voting closer to each other as opposed to, again, look at these earlier Congresses where you got these people who were red, who were kind of over near the blue and vice versa. Um, uh, Again, I, I apologize if there are spoken questions. I don't want to to not get at those. I just happen to see these written ones in front of me. Um, Lauren McCall to everyone. Uh, I teach sixth to eighth grade language arts. What next steps do you recommend that I prioritize for incorporating discussions about rhetoric with virtual learning? Um, that boy, the virtual makes it. Well, actually, I don't know if it makes it tricky or not. Um, I think one thing that's quite effective, 
Well, I can talk a little bit about how I do this with, with college students, and hopefully this will have some um, connection. But I can actually even think back. I took an oral communication uh, course. I believe it was my freshman year of high school, so it would have been fairly close. Now, that was all in person, face to face. Um, but what we were doing, I suspect, could be transferable to the virtual environment. Um, what we would do was we would write speeches on spe specific sorts of speeches or specific sorts of compositions. It was both written and spoken. Um, and we would give them sometimes. Now, these were not extemporaneous. Um, one advantage, I think, of doing this virtually, um, and I mean, I, I suspect this is the case. It's certainly happening with me right now. Um, public speaking can be quite frightening. I mean, I, you know, been teaching college now since what to 1999 basically um i still get nervous when i get up in front of a group i mean the first day of lecture is always just you know uh, butterflies in my stomach um doing this in front of a screen changes the the feedback mechanism right and there are you know the virtual side there's probably ways in which one could uh get some of that sort of non-spoken audience response mechanism that's so important to speaking. Um, in BB Collaborate, for example, you can do uh, thumbs up, thumbs down, clapping, things like that. You can, uh, there's the, is it good, is it bad? And, and you can kind of glance and that's a sort of imperfect proxy for what I prefer, which is seeing facial expressions or seeing body language. Um, it's, you know, certain bodily cues are unambiguous. Again, when I'm lecturing in the big lecture hall and I start seeing the students do this, I mean, that means something. That means it's time to tell a joke <laughs> or time to take a little break. Um, so that's how I might think about it. On the, you know, have them do some of the sort of written and maybe even performative things you might have normally had them do, or alternatively, rather than, um, you know, depending on class size, maybe it would be a student giving a, a, a speech to a class of 20 or 25 or whatever the number would be, put them in small groups. And then they can actually see if it's, you know, Zoom or BB Collaborate, they can see the facial responses of their peers, which again is so important. Um, and then they can sort of workshop with each other. Um, I mean, that would be my take. Um, I mean, that, that was all very specific to virtual. Um, to get it just broadly speaking into it, um, I, I'm a fan of having students read sources. Uh, and um, they could read some chunks of, uh, in particular, I would suggest Cicero. Um, Cicero's wrote a dialogue called On the Ideal Orator, in which he goes through and talks about character and emotion. And the fun thing about it being a dialogue is they're actually engaging in the things that he's talking about. And this person speaks in a way fitting this social station, and this person speaks in the way of this social station. And, and in particular, what I like about dialogues is you can have students read them out loud. When I teach Plato, I often have students read them out loud. I think it's, it's useful to think about not just the words on the page, but the way in which the words come to life through speech. I'm, I'm hoping that's helpful. All right. Thank you so much, Professor Kappist. We'll give it one more minute just in case there's any um, last questions. All right, not seeing anything in the chat. Um, thank you so much, Professor Kappist, for joining us tonight. Um, this was very informative. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Um, next week is our final uh, lecture in the series, and we're going to be talking about voting during a pandemic. Uh, so please tune in next week uh, for our final installment. Thank you again, everyone, and have a great evening. Okay, thank you.